Okay, uh, thanks everybody for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Chris Manor. Uh, I am uh, with the Revolutionary Students Union since we started at UVU. Um, if you also know me around Utah, I do uh, two things. I'm also with Utah Against Police Brutality as an organizer. Um, I'm also a member of the Freedom Road Socialist Organization. Um, I just want to be very clear though, I'm not speaking in either of those capacities tonight. I'm basically here to talk about riots and what I think about them and hopefully have a discussion about them. Um, so that said, uh, I also come from like an academic philosophical background. So if I start to go too much in that direction, you know, be sure to either make me explain a bunch of things or ground me into like an everyday conversation. Um, that said, uh, somebody willing to read the quote I have up there? If there's anybody. Okay, so that's from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, anybody else want to read it? Everybody want to read it all together? One, two, three. A riot is the language of the unheard. Okay, I'm glad you're all here and thank you for joining me. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you basically just a bunch of images of riots. Uh, I'm not really going to explain them because I think that's how we often get images. Uh, we just see them and there's never really a good, or there's always a prepared explanation of what it is. Um, but it doesn't really ask the question, what is a riot? So I'm going to go ahead and flip through several images. Uh, we can talk about it, but I'm going to go ahead and do that. Come as well. 
So then the question is, what is a riot? Um, does anybody have any initial thoughts? I mean, you're all here to listen to me, but you know, any ideas you want to bring to the table for a discussion about what is a riot? It seems like a riot could be uh, sorry, could be a riot. sure. Um, I'll. Given uh, the demographics of the room, I'll probably use a stack to facilitate comments. Um, but go ahead for now. And what I mean by that is, you know, I'll make sure women have a voice here. I'll make sure national minorities and oppressed nationalities have a voice here. Um, so white dudes don't dominate the conversation, and it just becomes a bunch of people listening to a bunch of white dudes. So uh, please go ahead, though. Not my eyes, but like on the other side, you know what I mean? I mean, we're talking about us, or we're talking about like as far as what it is to us or to the system. Mm. Um, well, uh, just, you know, initial reaction. Um, like I saw a lot of, uh, I saw a lot of uh, variety within the, like the photos and the images. I saw what, um, you know, as, as far as the reality of the situations that you're looking at, there seem to be really different types of ordeals. Some seem like really, you know, violent uh, battles against militarized force. Some seem um, more targeted towards like destruction of, you know, property. Some seem like very peaceful and standing together in solidarity. But I think the um, <coughs> the kind of uh, most prominent link that I saw, uh, more so within the, the captions. Um, on place that kind of gave a hint to what was going on was that uh, they were all, all the things that happened in the images were um, responses to uh, oppressive systems or situations, which I guess would be the defining link that I saw. Mm. Yeah, you raise a lot of really good points. I mean, the images themselves don't tell the story, but you know the way we have our media set up is we're just bombarded with these images all the time. Uh, people try to you know say what's going on. They give different opinions about it. Opinions are formed and then reinforced through the media. Um, so the real question, though, I mean, to get to the heart of the issue is what is a riot? Now, this is what leads into my presentation, um, having showed you a bunch of images of what could be called riots. Um, I'm going to be talking a little about about uh, Alain Badiou. Uh, Alain Badiou is a contemporary French philosopher. Uh, he writes everything from 100-page treaties on the nature of being to small little, you know, 100-page books on love uh, and everything in between. Um, so I'll kind of, this is Alain Badiou, uh, picture of him. Uh, he still lives today. Uh, he's trying to kick out being in event three, which hopefully he makes it for my enjoyment, I suppose. Um, but this is actually a quote from the book I have here, uh, The Rebirth of History, Times of Riots and Uprisings. Uh, would there be any person here who would be willing to read this quote? Um, Adrian, please. Today there are riots throughout the world, from workers and peasants, riots in China, to youth riots in England, from the astonishing tenacity of crowds under gunfire in Syria, to massive protests in Iran from Palestinians demanding the unity of Fatan Hamas to Chicano San Pierre. In the United States, there are all sorts of riots, often violent, violent but sometimes barely hinted at mobilizing either specific groups or whole populations. They are prompted by governments and or employer decisions, electoral controversies, the activities of the police or an occupying army, even if by, or even by simple episodes in people's existence, they immediately take a militant turn or develop in the shadow of a more official protest. They're blindly progressive or blindly reactionary. Not every riot is up for grabs. What they all have in common is that they stir up masses of people on a theme that Things as they are must be regarded as unacceptable. Thank you so much. Um, so the, the bold text I do there is my bold text. Um, so not every right is up for grabs. Um, so just to say a little bit more about that, uh, at least for the images I showed you, uh, what we can talk about very briefly. So there was one that was the Tacoma riots or Seattle riots of 1886, which was the same year as the Haymarket massacre. 
Um, that was organized actually by the Knights of Labor to exclude Chinese uh, persons and immigrants from the labor force. Um, so that's blindly reactionary as it seems, um, unless you think Chinese people should be excluded from working class politics and those sorts of things, uh, giving, a, I guess, a bit of a nod to Kyle's uh, Sakai lecture. Um, but then there's also other things. Uh, the Virginia, I think, 2006 one, that was over, uh, I believe, a, a Black Friday uh, doorbuster sale. So again, just masses of people stirred up. Uh, you know, the question is, is, well, is it the same thing as people protesting for their rights, like the Chicano moratorium, where you know Chicanos protested by boycotting um, their jobs and sorts of things uh, in in direct response to one of uh, I forget the, the specific person's name, but a, a journalist that was murdered. Um, you know, the the Israel riot was about excluding African Americans and other blacks. Actually, not African Americans. Sorry, I misspoke. Uh, Africans from Africa, Black Africans specifically from Israel. Uh, yet again, it's, it seems like you know the same thing is like, well, there are people holding signs. Um, so the big takeaway, at least for me, is that whenever we see these images, we should always question, you know, what's really going on uh, beyond just these sort of things. Um, so, is there any questions up to this point? Okay, then I'll uh, keep going. So in Rebirth of History, Alain Badiou talks about three specific rights, um, what he kind of goes after an understanding. Um, he talks about immediate rights, he talks about latent rights, and he talks about historic rights. So an immediate riot, those involved are nothing but gangs, hooligans, thieves, brigands, in short, dangerous classes, contrasted with a morbid cult of property, defensive material possessions, and good citizens, the ones who never rebel against anything. So that's typically the way the popular media will portray events in Ferguson, right? It's all about looting, it's all about blacks in the streets, you know, what's really going on here? They just want to flip over cop cars, you know, why can't they just, you know, respect rule of law and order and all these sorts of things. Um, so let's talk a bit about more what an immediate riot means. Um, so uh, again, if I use a lot of quotes from the book, um, a lot of these are just sort of things for me to base my lecture on it's kind of my notes revealed um, but also I think it's helpful to have the text up there so again I don't just quote from the book and it's just a bunch of verbal acoustic noise um, so he says the spark that lights a prairie fire is always a state murder just as uniformly the government and its police not only categorically refuse to accept the slightest responsibility for the whole affair but use the riot as a pretext for reinforcing the arsenal of police and criminal justice system now, if anybody followed the events in Ferguson, does that seem right uh, based on what we've seen in the news? Do you want to say something about it? You're nodding. That, that seems like exactly what happened. A um, uh, young black man was murdered. The police officer refused to take responsibility for it. The system refused to take responsibility for it. Um, in the end, ultimately, no responsibility was taken on the side of the state. And instead, they used it as a pretext to send in the National Guard. Uh, everything up to and including the National Guard, military vehicles, etc., um, in order to defend their um, right. And so, I mean, the picture there is actually from Ferguson. Uh, again, the police armored vehicle, people with batons, people with assault weapons, uh, essentially policing a, a predominantly uh, African American black community uh, in Missouri, but uh, predominantly white police officers. So um, these are the characteristics he defines an immediate right as. Um, so basically, he just basically says that there's an immediate unrest. People are frustrated. They don't know what to do. Obviously, they're not going to go to the voting polls and be like, well, we should fix this, um, given that there's a historical tension always at play. Uh, again, if you think about Ferguson as a oppressed nation of black folks, uh, policed and occupied by a white supremacist government, meaning that it's predominantly whites who make all the decisions, um, where blacks have essentially no representation and no say or no self-determination about their own communities. Um, you know, the spearhead of this, uh, he basically says, is often it's youth, um, which will be contrasted when I'll talk about the other forms, the latent rights and the historic rights. But typically, you don't see the elderly out flipping cars. I mean, that's just kind of self-evident, hopefully. I'll, again, if you've got the, also the right that they do that, I'd love to see it. Um, so an immediate right is located in a territory of those who take part in it. Um, obviously, the riots were in Ferguson. Uh, they, they spread, and we could talk about the, the next point is that they spread by imitation. 
but the riots themselves were located in the poorest sections, right? Uh, the street where Mike Brown was murdered, but it wasn't like in you know a bank or rich white neighborhoods or suburbs or gated communities and those sorts of things. Um, he also says that an immediate riot is always indistinct when it comes to a subjective type. It summons and creates. So that's a bit jargon heavy. Um, what he's essentially saying here is that if a bunch of people flood into the streets, uh, anybody can sort of join them. Um, and this has actual political ramifications. Uh, you know, Kyle, you gave a presentation on the Ukraine. Uh, you know, it may have started out as like a naive, like, yeah, we're really fed up with the corruption of the government, but pretty soon fascists kind of joined the ranks uh, and started moving that direction. Uh, Ian, you also kind of indicated this uh, in discussions we've had where the uh, transit worker strikes in Brazil essentially were co-opted by fascists and rightist elements. Um, so this is sort of the thing is there's never like a clearly defined like people with politics and things they want. It's just sort of immediate outrage and frustration. Is that, uh, so that's, that covers the immediate rights. Was there any questions? Yeah. Um, you mentioned like corruption in the Ukraine. And I remember when I was watching like videos about what was going on in Brazil, mm -hmm. I remember a lot of people were talking about corruption is it seems like a word that like right wing forces use to like that's just as like I don't know, it just always seems like they're talking about corruption but nothing in specific. Just as a way to get people out into the streets and but then supporting their right wing policies. They don't mean anything in specific, right? I think that's exactly the point, right? They're saying this is corruption and it provokes a response. Um, and again they're using it for their own purposes. I think you're right on that point. Um, so um, that said, uh, this picture is from France. Uh, the example Badiou uses to talk about latent riots. Um, so he talks about basically uh, the Sarkozy government, which was the president at the time. The president is now uh, Francois Hollande. Sarkozy's government essentially wanted to eliminate some sort of pension program or some sort of protection for like government employees. Um, the response is what he characterizes as a latent riot. He says, without a doubt, these phenomena prime something that always occurs at the time of a riot, a division in apparatuses, whatever they may be, under the subjective pressure of slogans through which collective action tends to unify the people. Um, and so what he's saying it, it essentially here is that when it was about an attack on government workers, everybody was able to rally around it um, and basically unify people around a popular campaign to essentially say, no, this is a clearly uh, stupid policy. Um, the pension reforms clamorously demanded by the markets, uh, again, something that benefited the uh, rich ruling elites of France, but didn't do anything for the working class. Um, you know, I, you can think about that as uh, it involved students, it involved the working class um, to a certain extent. Um, and so, yeah, you get this sort of outpouring of people into the streets. Um, I'll just continue here. Like I said, if I, if I throw a bunch of text on there, I'm usually for my notes, but I'm also just kind of throwing it out there for everybody. So basically what he talks about with these riots was the unions actually were, in a sense, complicit with Sarkozy, but the rank and file leadership were just like, yeah, this is really not going to benefit anybody who's doing the work or working class people. Um, so there was an immediate schism between the, you know, the union leadership and the rank and file. So people registered obvious dissent in the procession of uh, several big union battalions, which were much more aggressive than their bosses and wanted uh, more now. So again, just the, the fact that the workers wanted something, which was not to have their pensions cut, uh, especially at the sort of demands that, well, we got to fix the economy and everybody has to take a hit on this one. So, you know, we got to, you know, pull up our belts and just march forward. Um, when again, they was sort of thrown onto the working class to do that. So what ends up happening with these kinds of things, it's a, it's a series of strikes and occupations. Um, but the difference is, right, the, for these ones in particular, right, if you think of a common strike where it's like a bunch of workers go on strike, either their contract wasn't fulfilled or you know, the employer did something shady uh, or they want better rights and those sorts of things. Um, what he's actually saying in this case of these ones were that you had workers who would do things like maybe a slowdown, which was where they just don't work as hard or they work slower paces. But then you would have people that go to the actual factory uh, and then stage an occupation, either you know, block cars coming in and out. So you can imagine like, um, you know, if you're involved in uh, freight handling and that sort of thing, if, if all the people you know, who normally like are students or doctors, these sorts of things who aren't directly linked uh, by employment to the factory, 
uh, start going and supporting the workers by doing these kinds of occupying things where you're blocking you know, brown trucks from delivering freight, that in a sense also slows down um, and takes a stab at the bosses. But it's based on a sort of popular unity and a popular tactic. So it's kind of the link of strikes and occupations. Um, the practice of proxy strikes or free strikes, a specific factory establishment that goes on strike, even though the wage earners declare themselves to be at work. This involves a popular external detachment, mainly composed of people not obliged to work. So here you can things like doctors, the homeless, students, anybody who has, doesn't work the normal nine to five shift. Uh, they basically just get involved uh, on behalf of the workers um, and with their agreements, he makes that kind of clear. You don't just go to some random factory and start saying, I'm here to represent the workers and we're gonna shut this down, yada, yada, yada. Um, so basically what he says is uh, there's things about this that are really positive. Uh, it scorns the habitually reactionary opinion that according to the affairs of a site are those of its wage earners and them alone. So <clears throat> he says it unwavingly challenges the uh, no less reactionary judgment that it is immoral to go on strike while declaring oneself not to be on strike. It absolutely links strike and occupation habitually separated by at least one rung in the ladder of the violence of action. It thereby creates a shared localization and not merely limited localization, as would it be the case if the wage earners participated in the occupation. It has to be prepared for the inevitable arrival of police, which puts on the agenda the classic debate of riots between peaceful abandonment of the site or staying put and resisting. It affects an action of link between several social strata that are generally separated, thus created on the spot a new subjective type beyond the fragmentation reproduced by the state and its union appendages. So again, it's just a building a popular front, a united front of people who are willing to, you know, stand in solidarity, but a little more than solidarity of just like, you know, willing to put yourself on the line. Uh, and again, you could say something about the history of France, given that they always have things. Europe tends to have a lot more action, so to speak, than America, although that's kind of changed post Ferguson. But, uh, you know, this is something to say about uh, latent rates. Does anybody have any kind of questions? I know that's a lot of jargon. Yeah, Jacob? Yeah, what's the difference between, say, a latent riot and a quasi riot in this situation? So, what he's saying here, uh, the difference between a latent riot and a quasi riot, is, he's saying that a latent riot isn't exactly the same thing you would see on TV where people are flipping cop cars. So, when he says it's somewhat riotous, as in quasi riotous, a riot, riotous. He's actually just saying there's some features about this that could lead to say like when the police show up, uh, are they going to beat the protesters and then they're going to go home, or are they going to you know hold the front line in the barricade, and that leads to some other things. But he also says uh, in general these are typical of like affluent societies like France as opposed to say poorer suburbs, uh, the banlieues as he calls it, which are sort of the French version of the barrio uh, or poor neighborhoods. OK. So then the question is, uh, the third type of riot is a historical riot. Um, it is the result of the transformation of an immediate riot, which we talked about first, into a more nihilistic than political, into a pre-political riot. So this is his main example, was Tahir Square. Um, it was unified around a central demand of Mubarak clear off. And I'll say why that's important pertaining to uh, the historic right, um, but the general idea here is that with Tahir Square, right, it started with a couple of people in the streets and then it turned into a full-scale occupation of a very specific site uh, by the Egyptian people. Um, but it wasn't like an immediate riot where you can't really tell what people want. You can tell they're frustrated, you can tell they're fed up with their conditions, they can't take the way the world is going any longer. Uh, the ruling class can no longer maintain the same sort of um, leadership and ways of maintaining law and order. The people can no longer live in the same conditions. Um, but at this point, a historical right is defined by um, something different than an immediate right and something different than a latent right. So essentially, just three things is that one, uh, it turns into Tahir Square as opposed to just Egypt. Right? P protesters have rallied at Tahir Square. Um, they put themselves there. Uh, if anybody remembers this on TV, like watching it, um, it was pretty clear that you know you tune into updates to see what was going on to Tahir Square that day. An immediate riot can hold out for between one and five days at most, but a historical riot will take weeks and months, which again, if you remember, uh, if anybody saw the Egyptian revolution in a sense, uh, it was on TV for quite a while. 
So then, uh, to say something about uh, this difference between imitation and whatnot, the intermediate right, if you'll notice, kind of spreads. Uh, if you see people in Ferguson doing something, you're like, well, we should do that here. Um, and that's a very common thing, is to just imitate what's going on in Ferguson. Uh, shut it down is a good example of this. Occupy was a good example of this. If anything, the occupation of Tahrir Square turned into Occupy Zuccotti Park, um, and it sort of spread throughout the United States. Well, if they can do it, we can do it. Um, so there's something a little different um, going on with the historical right. Uh, basically, when I said that the immediate right is composed of youth and student um, persons, the historic right um, basically takes on every aspect of society. Um, they sort of walk out of their jobs. They Again, millions of people were occupying Tahrir Square, and it's everything from students to factory workers, intellectuals, families large numbers of women, civil servants, and even police officers and soldiers uh, join the ranks of the people. Um, and essentially to make one single slogan that involves all disparate voices. That slogan, of course, was Mubarak out now, Mubarak clear off. Um, and basically people just do that until you know, they get what they wanted. And if you remember, Mubarak is no longer the president of Egypt, um, even though he was that for 40 years. Um, but this, this will lead into like a, another discussion I'm thinking about in a second. But to say something more about the historical riot, a riot becomes historical when its localization ceases to be limited, but grounds in the occupied space the promise of a new long-term temporality. So again, Tahir Square occupied for months on end. When, it com when its composition stops being uniform, but gradually outlines a unified representation and mosaic form of all the people, so not just youth, not just students, but every aspect of society becomes uh, immersed in the struggle and the occupation of Tahrir Square. Uh, when finally the negative growling of pure rebellion is succeeded by the assertion of a shared demand, Mubarak out now, whose satisfaction confers an initial award on the victory, which is Mubarak no longer being the president. So this giant uh, paragraph essentially is just saying that when the Egyptian people rose up. Everybody obviously had an opinion about it. A lot of Americans were like, look, they're just doing what the founding fathers did. It's their, it's their version of the American Revolution, um, which is very kind of condescending coming from a Western power which dominates the globe uh, when you try to narrativize another uprising, and, uh, especially when the president of that country was essentially backed and financed by your country. Um, but, you know, instead of having the, the evil dictator Mubarak, who's been president for 40 years, what they really just wanted was, you know, our style of democracy. You know, they want to have a more open market. They want to have all these things that they sort of look at us to and envy. Um, so this idea of Western inclusion, of being involved in the international community, where, you know, they can just be like all the other European powers, you know, because it's finally time for them to, you know, to become included. So that's kind of just what that's talking about. Is there any kind of questions at this point? Um, uh, how how like representative of, is that of like the people's general desires, or are you saying, or, or what are you saying this desire for the West and to, to be a Western democracy, Western style democracy? Are you saying that that was a popular demand of the people of Egypt, or? Yeah. I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is that uh, there's a way the media would cover it, way uh, you know, pundits would go on the air and sort of form this opinion about the Egyptian revolution, uh, viewing it from the West, from the perspective of Westerners, to say that, yeah, this evil, tyrannical dictator Mubarak, you know, obviously we're in the 21st century, nobody wants a dictator. What they really want is you know, to have elections, they want to you know, be able to have a fair say. They want to have open markets uh, where people can go and buy the things they want instead of you know, uh, the evil style of just you know, getting stipends from the state to go buy at the state store, that sort of thing. I mean, does that answer your question? Yeah, OK. So you moved on into like a, a narrative part of like what, is, what motivates uh, right? What I'm saying is that the way the maybe uh, so what I'm saying is basically the way Egypt was viewed by America, what they really want is democracy. What they want is elections, as opposed to an evil dictator. Now, that may or may not be true for the Egyptian people, but how do we actually tell that? Is it through the opinions formed by you know, Rush Limbaugh, 
there are all these other you know right wing pundits about something they have no knowledge of uh, because they haven't investigated it. But it's just sort of a way for the West to look at it and say what they really want us to be like us. Yeah. They want our style. They want our American way of life. And this is what they're doing. Um, so, um, Jacob, you had your hand up. Yeah, I mean, do you feel like that strongly characterizes the way that uh, specifically people in the United States uh, look at the Hong Kong, recent Hong Kong protests? Uh, I haven't actually really followed that too much, so I'm, I'm declining to comment on something I haven't followed. Um, so. Now, this, uh, if we remember, what was the quote we read at the beginning of the presentation? It was by Martin Luther King Jr. Right is the language of the unheard. So, a right is the language of the unheard. So, in uh, the book, he talks about this concept of the inexistent. Um, so, essentially, what he's saying by this is, you know, there are masses of people all across the globe. Um, you know, there are poor immigrant workers all across the globe. But when we think about, you know, especially when we turn on the news, like the people who have the greatest degree of existence uh, are, again, the, the politicians, the celebrities, and that sort of thing, while many of nameless workers are, you know, shot down in South African mines protesting their rights. Uh, all these people who essentially are just inexistent to us as such. They physically exist, you know, they have lives of their own, but for the most part, you know, that's not what we're given um, or talk about frequently. So he says, in a world structured by exploitation and oppression, masses of people have, strictly speaking, no existence. They count for nothing. So he says, let us call these people who are present in the world but absent from its meaning and decisions about its future, the inexistent of the world. We shall then say that a change of world is real when an inexistent of the world starts to exist in the same world with maximum intensity. An event is signaled by the fact that an inexistent is going to attain genuine existence and intense existence relative to a world. So again, I'm going to hammer home on the Egyptian example because that's mostly what Badu talks about. With the inexistent, right, it's no longer these sort of people we might think about on occasion, you know, hanging out with the pyramids and that sort of thing. It's now the actual people on the news at Tahrir Square, which become the Egyptian people, right? You see them on the news, you see their struggle, you read about their actual stories online, um, as opposed to, again, just sort of abstract, you know, think about what people in Montana are doing right now. Like, does anybody know anybody from Montana? Okay, so a couple of you do. So, I mean, that, that at least for a couple of people, you can actually name people. But for the most of us, right, we get an idea that there are people. There's a population of Montana. I don't know what they're doing. I don't know who they are. I don't know where they live. I don't know what their cities look like. But for the most part, I mean, unless you're just an idealist, you're not going to deny that Montana exists. As, and there's people there. Um, Right. You can imagine what they're like based on our experiences here. Um, why don't we go with the more obvious example, Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. right? I mean, isn't that the call of the inexistent? Yes, I actually think that's right. Um, I think that's exactly right. So uh, Black Lives Matter has been taken up in the United States. Uh, you know, every 28 hours in this country, an African-American male, again, it's not just simply you can imagine it's like, okay, there's a person, this person is black, this person is male, uh, they have encounters with the cops, usually they end up shot to death uh, several times in the back. Um, but now it's coming to the point where it's like people in America, specifically black people in America, are now taking on a greater degree of existence and intensity of that existence than, say, last year. I mean, were a lot of people concerned about police brutality or even the city of Ferguson, like, last year, this time? I mean, I think the answer is just evidently no. So, um, you know, again, my wager is exactly what Greg has said, and I just want to say this. Uh, go ahead. Before the stuff that started happening with uh, Mike Brown, I had no idea if Ferguson, even existed. Yeah, <coughs> that's right. I mean, so the, the very fact that, you know, Missouri as a state, again, which ostensibly has a population of people, which, you know, you can look at the statistics, X amount of people are white, X amount of people are black. But now it's to the point where in America we talk about Black Lives Matter as something new and novel to our situation. Um, so this gets to the sort of question, right, is a statement of people who are now taking on a genuine existence in the world. Um, the real question is, 
what do we do with Black Lives Matter? I mean, obviously the caveat here being that I'm a white guy, what do I do with Black Lives Matter? But in general, what are people doing with the slogan Black Lives Matter? So, out of a historic right, um, this is where Badu is going to talk about politics a lot. What politics means for Badu is not simply going to the voting polls, it's not, you know, lobbying for your politicians and participating with the American democracy system as it exists or European parliamentarian system. It's a, essentially about what we do in the streets, what people, groups of people, decide and discuss is important as we're the ones affected and what essentially we want to do about it. Um, you'll notice that can happen at any time, whereas the voting polls tend to close, you know, every four years and then you're stuck for four years of just really bad versions of imperialism from the Democrats versus really awful versions of imperialism from the Republicans. Um, and more importantly, the state sort of decides what's important at the time, right? You'll notice we just had immigration legislation passed because the state thought it was important to do so at the time. But how many of the 11 million uh, undocumented persons in the United States thought it's been important for the past you know, six or seven years that Obama's been in office when he ran on a platform of, hey, I'm gonna do something, because yes, we can. Right, so the everyday issues that we face as students, as undocumented persons, as LGBTQ, uh, as oppressed nationalities, um, as working class people, these are what's important and we form our politics out of those kind of things. Um, not what the state decides is important at the time being based on you know, political gaming, what people uh, are gonna push based on you know, gathering sympathies for an upcoming election, et cetera, et cetera. So that said, the, the question of politics then as it relates to what's on the screen here, is he talks about three things that are typically different after uh, a historic right, which again, you'll notice the slogan Mubarak off now doesn't necessarily talk about, well, what's gonna be different after Mubarak's out now. It's just like, this guy's really just the bane of our existence. It's probably a good thing that he's out now, but then the question is, is well, what comes after that? Um, so he talks about uh, contraction, intensification, and localization. So. Contraction whereby a small minority is the genuine existence of the whole riot is guarded by strict rules of membership of the organization. A formal demarcation is created between those who are of it and those who are not, which is as powerful as the demarcation during a riot between those who are there and those who stay home. So after this sort of initial riots, you know, people start having meetings, they start organizing, um, you know, there's sort of like an established body of people um, who show up, who do work, who do things that constitute uh, the mobilizing force for politics of that particular community. The intensification is preserved by militant activism, which is a life devoted to demands of action, a subjectivity that is keener or more sensitive to circumstances than one that has reverted to routine existence. So, you know, when people are willing to, on two days notice, go and protest a pro-police rally, it's because it's important to them. Something's different about the way they live their lives where it's, it's not acceptable anymore that you know, people can go out in the streets and say, we love police in a state where they're murdering people more than drug dealers, more than gang members, and more than child abusers. Um, you're willing to put off certain parts of your life to, to go and protest. Uh, you're more willing to go stand in freezing temperatures rather than just stay at home on New Year's Eve and you know, drink with friends or go to the bar and things we routinely do all the time. So localization will be guarded by a firm rule of conquest on the sites where one is present, a particular popular market, an African workers hostel, a factory, a tower block on some housing estate, and so on. Um, so in Utah, we have a lot of sites, I think. Um, you know, we have the federal building, we have the Matheson courthouse, we have the public safety building, um, we have intersections, right? And so the question is, is these different sites, um, what do they actually mean as far as where we carry out our struggle? Um, I mean, does that make sense, these types of things? Yeah, I mean, you're kind of, uh, basically it's like you hit them where it hurts. You know, we're talking about police brutality. We're going to riot, not riot, we're going to protest outside of the public safety building. If we have a federal issue, we're going to protest outside of the federal building. Mm. You know, things like that. Um, and you'll notice we've used the federal building for several occasions, whether it's protesting uh, George Zimmerman uh, basically getting his gun back and not having charges pressed against him. We've used it for police brutality issues. We've used it for Palestinian solidarity. 
Um, and so again, each time it's always different, but at the same time, right, it's, it's where we sort of congregate um, to voice our opposition. Um, so this is, uh, again, this is where I think I'm going to bring up Greg's discussion of Black Lives Matter. Um, Black Lives Matter is a statement of people who exist in our world, uh, who are the inexistent, who actually attain a genuine existence or a greater existence than what they had. Um, but then the question is, is it about identity specifically, or is there something more generic as it applies to every human being, uh, you know, altogether? So typically the way the state would define people, right? Think about when Barack Obama goes on television and says, the American people think this, and what it means to be an American person, and even the counterexample is, you're not American if you think this or that sort of thing. Well, the question is, is what is this American person supposed to be? And so this idea of having an identity based on being an American um, is something that Badu calls into question. He says, yeah, well, the state typically does that. It's a way to divide people based on you know, specific uh, things. And again, if you think about what he says about opinion polls here, he says the inordinate importance of opinion polls for the state derives exclusively from the fact that as the science of average statistics, opinion polls make, virtually, uh, make the virtual French person num exist numerically. So again, Americans think this uh, in response to the Ferguson riots, where, or Americans think this about whether or not Darren Wilson should have uh, been indicted. But then the question is, is, again, who are these American people when it's just reduced to a bunch of numbers um, based on what the state sort of registers as an opinion? Um, so, but uh, the other thing to keep in mind here is, again, if it's a positive assertion about what it means to be American, and then it's what it means to be not American, you can sort of sort of say, well, we should go after these un-American activities as they did with the communists. Um, if you're not American, uh, you should get out. Um, and all these people are sort of suspect. Um, so there's all sorts of different separating names as he talks about with these people. Um, examples of separating names, an Islamist, a Burqa, youth from the Banlus, Muslims, Romans, Arabs, and black. And right, and so the state, in a certain sense, uh, you know, let's just say, for example, well, how come we don't talk about black on black crime or these sorts of things? It's a way of targeting a very specific set of people uh, for um, ways to attack them. So, this is where Badu says, well, what we should actually think about uh, is the politics of how we want to organize ourselves, not just the sort of you know, statements of Black Lives Matter. Um, so let us say, by justice today, it is only, or even primarily, to be understood the eradication of separating words. We must affirm the generic, universal, and never identitarian ca character of any political truth. This involves dispelling, through the real consequences of a choice of truth, the fiction of identitarian object, the average state object, F as in the French, or A as in American, and the like. In a powerful confrontation with the state oppression, this point validates a politics inherent to, on remaining faithful to a historic right. So again, the Egyptian people, I mean, that's maybe too specific, but for their specific situation, right, that doesn't mean men, doesn't mean women, it doesn't mean uh, Egyptians who are born of African descent, who are black, versus Egyptians who are Arab, uh, you know, secular versus people who belong to the Muslim Brotherhood. Everybody, in a certain sense, wanted Mubarak out now. Um, but then the question is, once Mubarak's out now, who gets to decide after that? Is it a political decision based on everybody taken together? Um, or what he says here is, uh, I shall therefore say the organization and hence politics exists when the power of the generic is preserved outside the movement, outside the right. So for Badu, politics takes account of the collective of people. Um, moving forward based on a truth that nobody can be excluded from this. So let me give like one example from what Badu talks about. A lot of people might think about Germany uh, and the Jews. Uh, often the Germans say, yeah, we're the truth of the movement, which is what Martin Heidegger said, the truth of National Socialism and these sorts of things. Well, that truth only applied to a very specific set of people, which were Aryans of German descent, who were grounded in the blood and the soil of the nation, uh, anybody who wasn't a part of that specific identity <laughs> couldn't participate in the truth of the politics. In fact, they had to be radically excluded and removed, uh, even exterminated. 
Um, the American Revolution, as we talked about, well, it's a great event uh, in American history, but the question is, who did it actually really benefit? I mean, it was simply something that we have, we hold these truths to be self-evident, but they're only for white men of property. You know, these are the truths we hold self-evident. Um, now, the question is, what, what would the opposite of that look like? What would a different possibility of politics, which takes in common everybody, um, and how would we apply a truth to that that means something for everybody? So a political truth is a series of consequences organized on the condition of an idea, a massive popular event in which intensification, contraction, and localization replace an identitarian object and the separating names bound up with it with a real presentation of generic power of the multiple. So that's, again, a lot of jargon and phrase mongering. Uh, but to give an example about this, this is why the French Revolution is something different. Uh, you know, if you think about what it was before the French Revolution, where you have an aristocracy, you have the peasants, you have the king, all the king's, you know, court and everything like that, right? Those are separating names which determine a different class of people, different privileges for certain classes, uh, different crimes imposed on other classes. Um, and after the French Revolution, it becomes a matter of the citizen. The citizen is what's important, right? Who can be a citizen? Anybody can be a citizen. Um, this also, again, is carried out in consequences for the Haitian Revolution, where Haitian slaves revolted against French occupying armies and then were received as actual citizens in France uh, rather than slaves. So the citizen, anybody can, in a certain sense, as opposed to the German, the good German, uh, the citizen is something that's generic and can in incorporate anybody into it. And then the truths can then apply as a truth rather than only one-sided. Um, but then, of course, the question is, is how do these consequences then carry themselves out? Um, that's always the organization of politics. Um, there's a Brecht poem in there. I, I'm short on time here, I guess, so I probably won't read that. But it's in praise of dialectics. It appears in the book. So I mean, given the discussion at hand, um, you know, Greg brought up Black Lives Matter. And then the question is, is well, is police brutality something that, yes, disproportionately affects blacks than it does whites? But when we talk about, say, something like police brutality, uh, do we want a, a solution to where no person should be the victim of police violence and police terror? Um, so I mean, that's kind of the idea of something being generic versus something being strictly uh, addressed to one identity. Um, but that's kind of just, I guess, the end of the presentation, because the button doesn't do anything else. Uh, but at this point, you know, I'm willing to open it up for a discussion. If there's something really, really confusing or whatever, we can talk about it. Please. Yeah, what would you say, uh, at least in your view or by Badu's view, what would be the difference between a riot and just like sort of like a more generic rally? Are they the same? Are they overlapping events? Because you know a lot of the pictures you showed us at the beginning were just rallies where police showed up and sometimes they shot gas and sometimes they didn't. But it didn't launch something like a Tahrir Square. So I, what you're touching on might be the difference between the immediate and the historical. So yeah, I mean, we've held rallies in Salt Lake City. I even included a picture of something we did where we shut down an intersection uh, for a time being. But you'll. After that, it sort of evaporated, and then the situation carried on as normal. Um, so I mean, yeah, a rally might change the appearance of the federal building for a couple hours, as opposed to, say, a place of business for our senators, uh, you know, people walking past, shopping for groceries, going to the Harmons, to a place where people are chanting slogans of, um, from Ferguson to Palestine, occupation is a crime, from Ferguson to SLC, and police brutality. So in a certain sense, it changed the character of the world for a minute, the situation, the street corner, um, just as a riot might do, though. So there's a similarity in that aspect. But to get to the point about what's immediate about something is that it, it doesn't clearly define any sort of specific task. It's a lot of people frustrated. It may be violent. It may not be. Um, but for the most part, the idea is that a riot, an immediate riot, doesn't have a proper, clearly defined political organization. It's just a lot of people gathering in one space for a minute, changing the composition of that particular street corner.
I'm saying a lot of words. I'm going to. So would you say that perhaps like an example of like a really large rally that's organized by somebody for like, I don't know, not like torches for freedom, but like, you know, like a, I don't know, like something that organizes a rally for a specific group around a very specific event or demand or something like that would be different from a sort of spontaneous uh, rally that was held like right after, say, for instance, the acquittal of George Zimmerman, for instance. Would you say that like maybe that is a theoretical distinction worth making and that's what you're doing or? I guess I didn't understand your question. Okay, so it seemed to me at the very beginning you were saying that it actually formulated this as a sort of spontaneous event around a sort of reaction. And that would be different from, like, say, for instance, a rally or a march put on, like, um, like by a specific organization. Like, say, for instance, if a union has like a rally or a march or something like that, would that be different from, like, a sort? Of, is what the difference is is because it's a, a riot is defined by a sort of spontaneous coalescing. An immediate riot. Right. I mean, I think I think there's arguments that go both ways. I just I would leave it at that. I mean, but I'm, I'm asking. Well, in, in terms of the presentation, is that what you're you're claiming? Uh, I'm claiming what Badiou says about immediate rights is just that it it manifests itself out of a general popular outrage. Uh, it could involve property destruction and flipping on cars. It could involve popular signs and slogans. Um, but in general, it just doesn't define a clear demand and tends to last like maybe a couple days at tops or even just a couple hours on the street corner before something happens or doesn't happen. Any other questions? Uh, there's been a lot of men have talked. Uh, there have been some women. Do any of the women have questions? Kyle, go ahead. Um, so you talked about shifting from like the individual or identity-based demand to something more generic. Is Black Lives Matter a generic demand, or do you think it's kind of pre-generic? Do you think that will get to like a higher stage of, of that? Because I, I feel like in Egypt, things are slightly different. Like we can say, um, you know, the bar must go, we need to free political prisoners, we need bread, you know, we need the army to stop interfering with things. And those are specific. And then those can graduate to like a more generic demand for like more participation in the economy by ordinary people or whatever. But it seems like in a place like the US where the oppression is concentrated already in a specific group, it seems like Black Lives Matter is already kind of a kind of like a high level slogan. Like it's already pretty it seems fairly generic. And there's and we've seen that at the rally sometimes where um, that one lady at the rally a few weeks ago was like White Lives Matter or something like that. Like all lives so, matter. Yeah, all, and it was meant kind of specifically to counter that, you know, identitarian politics of like people of color or lives matter. When I feel like that's kind of the point of the ground. So I don't know. That's just the point I have. Um, there was one thing you said I thought was interesting with that Black Lives Matter is a demand as such. Um, I think it's a statement of of again people who have been completely marginalized by the society affirming their own existence in the society. Now again, I say that as a white man, so I can't really say what black lives mean to actual black folks. Um, you should ask them, obviously. Um, but what I would also say is that it's not a demand in that, you know, who is Black Lives Matter specifically directed towards and what does it actually demand from as such? Uh, did you want to go ahead and say something, please? Um, yeah, the thing about Black Lives Matter uh, versus All Lives Matter Yes, we should be saying all lives matter, but here's the thing, I guess, you know, in response to all of these things that happen, these, uh, you know, the police shootings and the oppression of African Americans and of people of color, those things seek to, like, kind of cover up the idea that Black Lives Matter, like, the thing about the slogan Black Lives Matter is to say, hey, have you forgotten that Black Lives Matter, you know, we're reminding you, we're affirming, we're, um, and when I say me, when I say we, I don't mean myself, I mean like this is what they say, but uh, what I think Black Lives Matter intends to put out there is these people don't think that Black Lives Matter. We are expressing 
they are very assert we're asserting well black people are asserting that they matter. Yeah. And the, and the you know, police seem to think that black lives don't matter because they keep shooting them. Yeah. yeah. Right, and I mean, if you think about it also in context of a society that is a white supremacist society, meaning where all our political, economic, and social institutions, and there's obviously a deep-seated ideology of treating uh, black Americans and African Americans and anybody who's just not white in this country as inferior, uh, based on always judging them, always holding them to a double standard, and all these sorts of things. Yeah, there's a certain element of demanding the recognition that, hey, we don't want to be treated the way we've been treated so far. Uh, because our lives matter. Now, th the question is, is what does it actually demand though, right? So if black lives matter, what should be changed in the situation? And how should it be changed? What are the politics behind that? Um, and again, I'm not asking, like I'm asking a question because I'm not you know, gonna make that sort of call. So to, to make Badu's point, I'll get, sorry, I saw your hand in, is that a statement of the inexistent is black lives matter. But then what we do about police brutality, uh, I think is something different. There's a politics behind it. Um, and this is, I don't know, just a little bit of clarification. So you talked about immediate late and then historic. Um, and I guess I was a little bit unclear on like the, the place of historic. Because like, like you mentioned, immediate right is um, you know, the immediate transformation, maybe the immediate return to after you know, said action or whatever is going on is done. Mm -hmm. Um, and the historical right is after this is done, you know, history is made, um, in, in a sense, right? Like something is different, something is new. Mm -hmm. um, but the late right is that so that's more or less is that an extent? Like I guess the way I'm kind of thinking about it is it's an extended immediate right in the sense that you know a faction might be occupied for a week or something, or a faction might be occupied for a whole day. And after this is done, like, mm -hmm. but after this is done, like maybe things might be slightly different, like something might be one. But for the most part, it's. Uh, I'm just trying to, like, because it's, it's, yeah, sorry, I'm in my questions. Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll try to give a quick recap. So an immediate riot would basically be composed of the youth as to where a latent riot is composed of, of more broad base of individuals. Um, a historic riot usually is what happens after an immediate riot uh, takes place. So at this point, you know, Ferguson protesters are still going on. Obviously, the media has moved on, but they're still there trying to make history in a sense. Um, does that, does those at least initial comments well, I, I mean, I guess what I'm more or less trying to look at is, um, the, it, so the latent riot is, um, I guess I'm, I'm looking at like the direct effects of the immediate riot. There's not much of an effect, at least directly from this, um, from what happened from there, unless, you know, like, but you know, like when we protest outside the way, you know, the, the federal building, after we're done there, it becomes just a federal building, it becomes just a harm, it becomes just an intersection. Mm -hmm. um, after, you know, after the two year square uprisings, um, you know, Egypt wasn't the same. Mm -hmm. um, but with the late riots, is it um, more or less just like this is, um, you know, so, so it comprises a wider base of people? Mm -hmm. Or is it just like maybe something small was gained? Like, um, something small was gained, I think. Okay, so, so it's like saying like this, something small was gained. It doesn't really matter if like it lasted two hours or. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so I think uh, to maybe make a clarification, the late riot might address a particular policy that might be imp implemented. So, you know, for instance, uh, when they passed SB 1070, there were, I think, were late riots, there were sit-ins, there were sort of occupations, um, you know, to basically prevent uh, a bill which would have targeted anybody brown for the possibility of having uh, search and, uh, being searched and, uh, sorry, maybe just to say it a little better. They would have basically uh, mandated that police officers would have stopped anybody on the probable cause that they were uh, in the country illegally, which essentially means you're brown. Uh, they're not going to go after people who look like they're here illegally from Eastern Europe. Um, I don't know, Sweden or Norway or any other type of you know, white European country. Um, so yeah, there were several different things. There were different uh, groups of people forming a united front to, to attack one specific piece of legislation. Um, and then afterwards, you know, the situation is, re remains fundamentally unchanged. Okay, so I mean, so I mean just like for context, like to hear Spurred be historic, you know, us occupying your section might be considered immediate, but you know, the stopping of the SB 1070 bill would be late. I, I, I would think, I'd be feel comfortable saying that, yes. Okay, awesome, thank you.
So uh, initially we asked, uh, what's your favorite riot? Um, obviously, that didn't cover too much of the history. Um, you know, there's there's plenty of riots at the beginning. Uh, if you, when I was like doing initial research for this, there's actually a Wikipedia page on riots. There's even a Wikipedia page on race riots. Uh, the funny thing that occurs to me is that you know when you're looking at it, the 17th century, the 18th century, there's essentially more riots in 2012 or 2013 than there ever have been in the entire duration of like the 19th century. So if anything, riots and uprisings are more and more frequent. Um, that obviously deserves a, an explanation and elaboration of why, um, but you know that's kind of something I thought was interesting about the research for this. Um, well, that said, I, again we can continue with discussion. Uh, if, if there's something that's still like unresolved or were the, um, the riots in the 19th century uh, or 18th century uh, were they more violent and more people killed usually than the ones that? Are um, so, you're asking me about very particular circumstances. I'm just going to say I didn't do in-depth research, so I don't have that answer. Um, yeah, I mean, I could speculate, but I also don't think that does anybody any good. Unless anybody also wants to comment on that. I mean, you can imagine the king's troops showing no quarter versus, like, the police just beating people and macing them. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, Greg? Well, and part of it is also um, the increase of technology has reduced lethality. So, you know, how do you put down a riot in 1700s, 1800s, 19, early 1900s? It's with bullets, good old fashioned bullets. And when you billy club someone, you beat them to death. Um, whereas now you can, not that they're by any means more peaceful, it's just, uh, cops can now just very comfortably, you know, just fire rubber bullets into a crowd indiscriminately, and the death toll will generally be very small. They can tear gas a bunch of people, and the death toll will generally be very small. Um, but, you know, when things get real, like in Tahir Square, they will immediately go to lethal violence. Mm -hmm. What was I going to say? Uh, specifically, um, also with the kind of levels of violence that take place, uh, I'm trying to recapture a train of thought, um, something Greg uh, said with me. Um, yeah, actually, race riots are kind of a good example of the state itself cooperating with lynch mobs, uh, you know, just racists, armed white racists in the South. Um, you know, a race riot could happen for any number of reasons. A uh, black man looks at a white woman wrong. Uh, this is actually what happened, I think, in New York in the 1900s. A black man basically kills an undercover cop, or not undercover, actually a plainclothes cop, because uh, he uh, was out with his white partner and uh, thought she was being attacked, so he stabs the guy and then runs off, and it turns out he's a cop. So then what happens is, well, every black person in New York City for X amount of square mile block radius uh, just gets dragged off buses and beaten and lynched and all sorts of things, right? And so that's kind of a common practice. Um, this, then you know it's it's also a common practice for you know cops to basically you know arrest somebody but then just turn them over to a lynch mob right and cooperating back and forth. So I think there's also you know different degrees of violence, uh, especially more brutal and barbarous forms, uh, depending on if it's a race riot versus it's a food riot or some sort of thing. Um, that's a thought. What do you what do people think? Jacob? It's probably worth pointing out that the body counts of people that died from riots uh, were not probably well documented, unless it was meant to illustrate a very particular point by those who controlled the news outlet. Um, but also just a second one, um, what Chris was saying is that there are many different types of violence that don't necessitate the ending of the life. Like, for instance, I guess a really good example of this is, was after the, the two cops were killed in New York, not the ones last night, but the ones a couple weeks ago. They were like, you guys are going to pay for this. And so, like, who's the you guys in this situation? There was one, just one person, you know, and this is the thing. It's, in the end, it didn't turn out because then they were, like, in a work stoppage. The point is that, you know, who is the 
who is it that's going to pay for this? And the answer is, you know, they're not just going to go around and start killing people. I mean, they do in a generic sense in their normal rigor world, but like not in the sense that like they're going to be punished. Did you say two, more uh, two cops got shot in the Bronx. Uh, they're expected to live. Um, okay, uh, then I'll just kind of maybe close on a final question. Um, you know, was this helpful to anybody here? Did anybody learn something different? Um, different ways to think about what you know we see on TV. Um, do, do you want to? You're nodding. Do you want to share? Or you don't have to. Uh, um, I, I guess just, um, I mean, maybe we ripped three separate categories to really think about things. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've sort of learned what it, what is considered a riot and what kind of riots actually make history and matter versus what kind of riots are just sort of like fucking shit up. I did have the pumpkin riot. You'll notice again the police didn't violently suppress protesters uh, who were again doing whatever. There's any number of like, the the Argentina riot was about the World Cup. Oh, okay. So, again, this is the thing, right? You see images on TV, right? What do they tell you about what's going on? Who knows? They're images. Um, and it, more importantly, I guess, the, the big thing I would emphasize is also when you see images on TV, you can think, oh, they're just uprising against their ruthless government. Um, it doesn't say anything about you know, the outside forces who might be influencing um, those particular riots. Um, so not every riot is up for grabs. Not everything that moves is red, so to speak. I'm, I'll leave it at that unless anybody else wants to have that. Or again, feel free to you know talk to me afterwards. All right. Well, yeah. Thanks for your time.